Philippians chapter 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. I think uh, I would do good to read that every single morning when I wake up. Don't look at your own interest. Consider others as more important than myself, right? Look out to the interest of others. Show honor to others. I fail at that way more than I succeed. How about you? And then you have other places because Paul says these things a lot, right? Paul really feels like that this sort of uh, attitude toward others is a true mark of a disciple of Jesus. And so he'll say things like in Romans chapter 12, he'll say, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Again, I fail at that more often than I succeed. But Paul really believes that this, looking to the interest of others, not thinking of ourselves as more highly than we ought to, showing honor to others, considering others more important, Paul really believes that this is a true mark of a disciple of Jesus. And I want us to keep those words from Philippians and Romans and even some of the other places where he talks about this very idea. I want us to keep those words from Paul in the back of our minds today as I walk us through a presentation. The first part of the sermon is going to be kind of in-house stuff. And so if, if you've been joining us for our online worship experience and you don't normally attend our church, uh, I, I want to apologize for this because this is going to be some in-house language. But but stick with us because I, I do hope that there's going to be a sermon in here that's applicable to all people uh, as we kind of walk through this. But, but the first part is going to be uh, a little in-house. Over the last couple of weeks, we've asked our missional partners to fill out an online survey. We had been uh, promoting the survey, sending out emails about it for a couple of weeks, asking you to do this. And it asked questions about, um, well, demographics, but then also uh, your experience with the online worship that we've been offering. And then uh, the thing that probably most of us are really interested in knowing, uh, it asks questions about uh, your expectations for re-entering our corporate worship gatherings. Um, and, and I want to, I want to present the, the results of that to you because I know a lot of you are interested in knowing how your other brothers and sisters in Christ feel. And so I want to present that to you and, um, and then maybe have a few words to say about, uh, some biblical attitudes that we should have, uh, toward, uh, people who maybe don't think or feel the same way, uh, that I do or that you do. So, we had 270 people um, participate in this online survey. Now, obviously, that's not our entire church, but I think 270 is a really good number. That, that kind of exceeded my expectations of uh, the number of people that would participate in this. And so thank you. Thank you for participating in this online worship experience. Now, regarding the section that has to do with the online uh, worship experience, um, I'm not going to say a whole lot. Okay, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that part of it. Uh, for the most part, everyone has been extremely supportive, uh, extremely understanding of our circumstances, and uh, and you've been pleased with uh, the work that that we've been doing with the online worship experience. Um, there were a few that for reasons maybe they just didn't have the technology to do it or for some it just didn't do anything for them and so a few of you responded saying that but that's, that's a very small number for the most part uh, everyone was extremely positive supportive and understanding 
Now, a lot of people offered some suggestions as to ways that we can improve our online worship experience. And, and we're very appreciative of your suggestions and, and we're listening, right? That's why we do this. We wanted to hear uh, what our church family had to say. And so we're listening. But one of the things that this survey really did for me was just highlight the, uh, the diversity of our congregation, right? You get 270 people responding to an online survey and you ask a question that leaves an open blank for uh, everyone to fill out the way they want to and you're going to see the sheer diversity uh, of that group. And that was true uh, of this survey in regards to um, suggestions for improving our online worship experience. There was a, a real diversity of responses to that. And and in many ways, that really makes it hard to be able to do everything, right? Because so many of you have different likes and dislikes and preferences and ideas. And so I say that simply to say that, that we are listening, that we've, we've been really paying attention and, and trying to see what our missional partners are saying about ways to improve the online worship experience, but know that we're not going to be able to implement everything that we read, right? For every comment that said, um, you know, why don't you change the scenery, get outside the building and record the sermon somewhere else? Because we know we're not worshiping in the building. So why do we have to keep recording in the building? For every comment like that, we would get another comment that would say, you need to record on the stage so that it looks like our church building and it looks like a real uh, OP church worship service. There's no way to win with that, right? How do you do one of those without disappointing uh, the other side that wanted the other thing? And so we had a lot of those types of comments, um, none of them bad, but just uh, contradictory of each other. Somebody would say, I like this, and somebody would say, I didn't really like this, and it would be the same thing. Or somebody would suggest, why don't you try this? And then someone else would say, why don't you try this? And they would be contradictory. And so it makes it hard to be able to do all the things that we uh, read about as suggestions for improving our online worship experience. But we trust that we are going to try our very best to do the things that we can do uh, to improve our online worship experience. We're going to take a lot of your um, suggestions into consideration, but just know that we can't possibly take all of them into consideration just due to the sheer diversity of those suggestions. So please, just trust that we're going to try to do what is best and we're going to try our best to listen and, and try to implement what we can. Uh, but know that even when we make mistakes and even in the moments where maybe we don't uh, do maybe something that you in particular uh, asked us to do, um, please trust that we have uh, the best of intentions um, and that we are trying our very best. Okay, so the part that you really want to know about is probably uh, the expectations that people have for re-entering our Sunday morning corporate worship gatherings. Um, this is the part that, that most of us are truly interested in because it's where all of our hearts and minds are right now. Is kind of when are we going to uh, be able to get back together? When are we going to be able to uh, have our Sunday morning gatherings in the auditorium again? When are we going to be able uh, to, to uh, have church that's not just online in my living room again? And so uh, what I want to do is I want to... Uh, share with you basically uh, the results of all of those questions so that you can see where your brothers and sisters in Christ are in terms of uh, their expectations um, of re-entering uh, the corporate worship gathering. And so uh, right now I'm going to put on the screen um, the different uh, graphs, the different um, percentages of the ways people answer these questions. And I'm just going to run through these. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on any one of these. Um, as you can see there on the screen, what is the most important factor in helping you make a decision to return to corporate worship services? Uh, for the majority of you said, we're going to trust the OP church leadership. And, and that makes me as the preacher here feel really good that, that you would put that kind of trust in us. And so thank you for that. Um, after the stay-at-home orders, uh, you know, there's been a lot of recommendations to continue wearing masks. Um, and so this question was, would you attend a corporate worship service wearing a mask? And the majority of you said, yes, I would do that. And even some of you that said no, 
you've shared with me that you were just kind of confused as to what we were actually asking in that question um, and that uh, you would definitely wear a mask if it was something the elders uh, asked you to do and that you were simply saying, no, if it, if it was uh, my own choice, I probably wouldn't do it. Um, and that's why you said no, but you would definitely do it if, if asked by the leadership. And so I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Um, we have uh, these other two that I'm going to show you are, are probably uh, the real important ones that really help shape uh, what getting back together is going to look like. What precautions, if any, do you plan to take? These are the precautions you're going to take on your own without being asked. And you can see there all the different ones. Um, many of you are going to do your best to stand or, st or sit six feet away from everyone. Uh, you're going to avoid physical contact. Um, many of you said on your own you're going to wear a mask, right? Going back to that earlier question, uh, many of you are going to wear a mask even if not asked to do so. Um, avoid crowded hallways. Um, many of you said you're going to only participate in communion if it's in those individually wrapped uh, communion things. And, and some of you said, I'm not even uh, ready to do that yet, that I'm most likely going to continue to take communion at home with my family or maybe with a small group. The next one is uh, the expectations that you have of the leadership. What are the things that you really think the leadership of this church really need to be thinking about and, and implementing in order to make it a safe environment? And this was really important to us as a leadership to look at. Um, you know, the biggest one there was just eliminating the contribution trays. And this was something we had actually been thinking about doing anyway, really encouraging um, the online giving, uh, maybe setting up some uh some charitable contribution boxes, uh, charitable donation boxes throughout the building, and um, doing away with the passing of contribution trays. Uh, that was a big one for you. Um, uh, finding a new way to do communion, again, going back to maybe doing those individually wrapped communion packets or trying to find another way that might be safe. That was a big thing for many of you. Creating social distance seating, um, discouraging physical contact. Uh, I totally get that one, but it sounds funny to say, right, that as a church we would discourage people from hugging. But that's something that, that we need to do in this moment. Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, One-way foot traffic. You can see all the different things there that, that are expectations that you as a church have for the leadership. Again, at the end of that question was another kind of open blank. Um, what are some uh, other things that maybe we haven't listed that you would suggest we seriously consider? A lot of you talked about outdoor worship gatherings, and I'm going to talk more about that here in a little bit. Many of you have done your research, and you're all very aware of the information out there regarding corporate um, congregational singing, especially indoor singing. And so a lot of you have suggested that we consider um, not having congregational singing for a while or, or thinking of different ways to be able to do that. Um, we had suggestions for having small uh, worship, like multiple services of smaller gatherings. Some suggested that we take people's temperature. Um, I've already heard of another church in town that is doing that. Others said that maybe we should just hold off on uh, communion in our uh, worship gatherings and encourage all people to do that at home or in their small groups. Some said that, uh, you know, you're going to appreciate whatever precautions we may take, but you're still probably not going to attend for a little while longer. Uh, I get that. Um, and then even um, some just suggested, you know, I think this is all an overreaction. Um, things have been blown out of proportion. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. Which of the following describes the attendance level at which you'd be comfortable attending, right? Uh, over half of you said, I would only be comfortable if it's half filled or even less than that. And we uh, define half filled as six feet of empty space on your right and left in your pew and an empty pew in front of you and an empty pew behind you. Um, over half said that's what you'd be comfortable with. Some said, I, I want it to be, be even less than that. I want it one quarter filled. And then still some of you even said, I'm, I'm not even comfortable with any of those scenarios yet. Uh, I get that, and we're going to talk about that. Bible studies, uh, Bible classes, uh, many of you said uh, that uh, not ready for that yet. Uh, our classrooms are small. 
Um, and it's really hard to social distance in those settings and, and just not ready for that. And then we asked a question about uh, alternatives to gathering together, uh, maybe meeting in homes and small groups. That's something that Dan Knight talked about last week with... Um, their uh, real push to kind of kick off a small group summer session on the first Sunday in July, um, encouraging our groups to maybe meet together. Uh, it doesn't have to be indoors. It can be outside on a back patio. It can be on our church property. It can be at a park, but maybe finding a way to either uh, participate in the online worship service together as a small group and have discussions together, or uh, you participate in those online worship uh, experiences separately and then come together as a small group and discuss uh, the content of that online service for that morning. Um, a lot of you said that you're, you're comfortable doing that um, right now, and so there's a big push for trying to do that. So, as you can see, I, I rushed through that. Um, as you can see, there, there is a full range of expectations from our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a full range of feelings and emotions, um, and, and you should expect that from a church our size, right? You should expect that diversity, that there is a real diversity of opinions about what uh, many of you think we should be doing as a church and maybe what we shouldn't be doing as a church. So I want to talk about that for a moment. Last week, one of our missional partners shared uh, with me an article that I found to be really insightful. Uh, it was called Leading Three Different Groups Back to Church. Leading Three Different Groups Back to Church. And I mentioned to this missional partner that sent me this article, I said, don't be surprised if you hear a lot of this in a future sermon. So full disclosure, a lot of what I'm saying this morning, I have stolen from someone else. All right, I just want to put that out there. But I thought it was some good stuff and I want to share it with you. So Pastor Kevin Meyer, who uh, pastors a church called 12 Stones Church, he describes most churches right now in this moment as uh, traffic light churches, right? We know traffic lights. Traffic lights have uh, a, a green light, a yellow light, a red light, right? The green light go, the yellow light caution, uh, the red light stop. And for the most part, no church is any one of those lights, right? All churches are comprised of all three types of lights. And I'm going to talk about what that means here in a moment. But there's no church that is all fully a green light church or a yellow light church or red light, but rather we are a culmination of all three of the lights that you find on a traffic light. And so, okay, so what does that mean? We're traffic light churches. What does that mean? Right now, there are really about three different categories of people in our church. And this is true of all churches, but let's talk about OP Church. There are about three different categories of people in our church, and this can be gleaned from the results of our survey. The first group, which is probably the largest group in our church and most likely the largest group in all churches right now, the first group is uh, considered the yellow light group. You're right, the yellow light is the caution light. And this is probably 60, 70% of our congregation, maybe even more. But the yellow light is the caution light, right? Don't go too fast, but don't come to a complete stop either. Proceed with caution. And this is the group in our church that is willing to lay down their guard a little bit Venture outside just a little bit. Venture out into the public just a little bit, but they are not openly embracing it yet, right? Proceed with caution. They want there to be some precautions set in place before they uh, enter in some sort of public sphere, right? They want to know that the people in charge of whatever public sphere they might be venturing into has set up certain precautions and that they're doing all they can to be safe. These people in this group, the yellow light group, they want everyone, because they're going to do this, they want everyone to follow certain rules, and certain etiquette for the safety and the well-being of not just themselves, but the safety and the well-being of everyone around them. 
the yellow light group is they're going to wear a mask even if they're not asked to do so and they would be so much more comfortable if they knew that you were going to wear a mask too. They would appreciate um, seeing you in the lobby but they would also be really at ease if they knew that you weren't going to maul them with one of your hugs in the lobby because they're not ready for that yet. This group um, might even return to the building at different paces, right? They might not all venture back out into public at the same pace, but they're all doing it. They're just doing it at different paces. Some might decide to wait and watch for a little while, observe how things work before they truly come back themselves. This group has a... Um, they're, they're, they're being very cautious about all that's going on in the world right now. That's the, the largest group in almost all churches right now, and that's true of even our church, the OP church. The second group is considered the green light group. This group makes up probably 20% of our church, and the green light group is the go group, right? Because that's what green light means, go. And they're not going to walk back to the building whenever we reenter. They're going to run back to the building whenever we re-enter. And to be honest, many of the people in the green light group are a little bothered that we decided to uh, cancel our corporate worship services to begin with, right? A lot of the green light group is the group that, that thinks that a lot of this is an overreaction or blowing things out of proportion. The green light group doesn't wear masks out in public. And honestly, they probably don't sanitize any more now than they did um, pre-COVID. The green light group is ready just to kind of put all this behind us and get back to normal starting yesterday. That's the green light group. And then the third group that's in our church, but in all churches as well, is probably the smallest of the three groups, and that is the red light group. The red light means stop. And that's the red light. These are the people who have already decided that they are not going to venture out into public too much. And they're already decided that they're not going to re-enter a corporate worship gathering until either a vaccine has been created or they have determined that it's completely safe to do so. Many of the people in this red light group uh, are from the vulnerable categories. Maybe they are the elderly, or maybe they uh, already have some pre-existing health conditions that might make them more vulnerable uh, to COVID. Um, but that's not true of everyone in this group. It's not just the vulnerable who are in this category. There's a lot of people that are just very uh, anxious and fearful of what might happen if they let their guard down. And the risk of leaving their homes um, is just not worth the danger for them. Uh, and so that's the red light group. And they're probably going to stay at home for a little while longer, maybe a lot longer. So all three of these groups exist in all churches and all three of these groups exist in our church. And so the question is, what what can I possibly say to all three of these groups? And the first thing that I want to say is this. Faith has nothing to do with what group you fall into. I want you to hear that. Faith has nothing to do with which category of people you fall into, right? If you're a green light, yellow light, red light, faith does not have a factor in that, right? I've heard people say, well, you just need to have faith in God and just trust that he's going to protect us. We just need to have more faith in God that he's going to protect us in this. And that sounds good. It sounds good. And a lot of times it's the people in the green light group that are saying things like this. But the truth is this. Even the people in the green light group that might be saying we just need to have more faith that he's going to protect us, they still wear a seatbelt when they get in their car, right? Taking precautions doesn't have to be an indicator of a lack of faith, right? We have faith and we still wear a seatbelt. We have faith and we still do things in life that, uh, that are precautions so that we don't get hurt or we don't hurt others. And so um, I don't want anybody that 
that you, you hear this and, and you say, well, I'm in this group or in this group. I don't want you to hear anyone say that uh, that's an indicator of where your faith is, because I don't think this is a faith issue, okay? Um, everybody is in a different place, and that's okay, because it's not a faith issue. And we need to be careful not to minimize the legitimate fears of others. We need to make sure that we don't minimize the fears of others. Don't make fun of masks if you don't wear one, right? Respect people's boundaries. Don't assume that everyone's ready for a hug. Don't assume that they're ready to let their children be in close contact with other children or in close contact with you, right? Let's Think back to the Philippians passage that we read at the very beginning of this. Look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others, right? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Honor others above yourself. Or uh, I, I love the Romans 12, 10 passage where uh, Paul says, Love one another with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor, right? Outdo one another in trying to show honor. Listen, and I, and I mean this, how, how, how we view and treat others is more important than when we get back together. I believe that. And I want to say that again. How we view and treat one another is more important than when we get back together. And this is true in all situations, at all times, this isn't just a COVID-19 thing that we need to think about. This is applicable to all uh, parts of our lives. Our calling as disciples of Jesus, our calling as followers of Jesus is to live a life that reflects who he is. Our calling is not necessarily to go to church and to uh, participate in acts of worship. And so how we treat one another and how we view one another is more important than when we get back together. Are those things important? Is getting back together important? And is our corporate worship gatherings important? Yes, they are important, but they are not more important than living a life that reflects who Jesus is in this world. And so again, I want to say it one more time. How we view and treat others is more important than when we get back together. We look toward the interest of others as followers of Jesus. We honor others above ourselves as followers of Jesus. We try to outdo one another in showing each other love and honor as followers of Jesus. And that'll preach at any time in any situation. Okay, so the real question that's on your minds. So what are we going to do? I know that's your question. And so here is our plan at the moment. And if COVID-19 has taught us anything, it is that plans today can change tomorrow. So please give us the grace to change the plan if uh, the moment calls for it. But at the moment, right now, here is our plan. Listening to our church, we have decided that we are not prepared in this moment right now to re-enter our Sunday morning corporate worship gatherings. We just don't feel that right now we can do it in a way that is both meaningful but also in a way that makes everyone feel safe. We're just not convinced that we can do that, especially after reading a lot of what you said in terms of uh, the precautions that you hope that we will try to take. We're just not in a place where we feel like that we are able to do that. So what are we going to do? Well, first thing I want you to know is we are going to continue our online worship experience on Sundays. That's still going to be our primary way of, um, of uh, doing our Sunday morning worship, right? Is we're going to continue for the time being offering our online worship 
experiences on Sundays. But with that said, we do want to do something a little different. We do want to do something a little different. And so here's what we've decided we're going to do for a season. Starting on Sunday, June 21st, we are going to start offering outdoor praise and worship nights. Outdoor praise and worship nights. Now, these are not to replace our Sunday morning online worship experience, right? This is not um, a replacement for that. This is something kind of completely different from that, okay? So we're still going to have the online worship gathering that we want all of you to participate in. But starting on Sunday, uh, June 21st, we're going to start offering um, another thing that we can do, which is an outdoor praise and worship night. And this is going to be very informal, right? In a lot of ways, it's going to be like our first Wednesday praise and worship nights, if you've ever attended that before. Um, very kind of informal and laid back. Um, it's going to be a blend of acapella and instrumental. Uh, we, we may even uh, incorporate some devotional thoughts, allow some different people to share some devotional thoughts. It'll be, uh, we'll offer some times of prayer and stuff. But, but we're calling these outdoor praise and worship nights. And um, we're going to do this probably for about four weeks. At the moment, that's what we think. Probably about four weeks. So the 21st, the 28th. We haven't decided about July 5th yet because that's a holiday weekend and not sure uh, who will be available to make that work. And then uh, the following Sunday, July 12th, um, that's kind of the time span that we're looking at right now for doing these outdoor praise and worship nights. Now, I don't have all the details about what that's going to look like and all the, um, the precautions that are going to be set in place for even those things. And so this week, be looking for a video, this coming week, be looking for a video from us that's going to talk in more detail about what these outdoor praise and worship nights are going to look like, what types of things we're going to do, when it's, what time in the evening it's going to start, um, what are the precautions that we're going to have set up in place to make everyone feel safe. Um, we're, we're going to put out a video later this week that will explain all of those things. But we think this is going to be a really cool opportunity for us to be able to get together and do some worship together but still give us time to think about uh, our corporate worship gathering for Sunday mornings and what that's going to look like. This will give us more time to plan and prepare for that. So I hope you're excited about that. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be really cool. Um, we'll set up some canopies maybe. We'll ask you to bring your own chairs, and it'll just be a really cool time. And again, this week we'll put out a video that will share more information about that. I ask that you please be patient with the leadership. Please trust, um, please trust us to do what we think is in the best interest of our church and our mission. We're working hard to figure these things out. And the problem is there's no right answers, but we want to make the right decision. So that, that's the hard part in all this. And as for the different groups of people that are in our church, many of you are going to go at your own pace. No matter what leadership decides at this moment, many of you are going to go at your own pace. And that pace may be slower for some than it is for others. Please hear me when I say that is okay. We'll be here when you're ready. That is okay. Go at your own pace. We don't want anyone to feel pressured to do any of the things that uh, we are doing. We don't want you to feel pressured to, to even do our outdoor praise and worship night if that's not something that you feel comfortable doing yet. Go at your own pace. Know that it's not a faith issue and that it's okay to go at the pace that you feel comfortable with. For everyone else, please be patient with your brothers and sisters in Christ who may be at a different place than you are. Please be patient with everyone. Look to the interest of your brothers and sisters in Christ and outdo one another in showing honor and love. That's the way of Christ.